And following that decision to let go of the lockdown, we would also need to look at the public health and security implications. And so uh, we want to quickly uh, have an interaction with uh, Professor Alfred uh, Yorson, who is a member of the COVID-19 team, the Interministerial Government team, and more so um, Colonel Retard Festus Abwaje. Now, uh, he is a security consultant or analyst and also observes the sector for us. He has to be on radio, so we'll quickly uh, have to deal with him, and then we'll be with uh, Professor Yorson for the, for the rest of the, of the minutes that we're doing this discussion. But, um, Kenel, let's look at the security implications. There's, a, there's a, a, a message by the police that they posted on their Twitter handle, and it speaks volumes about what they intend doing um, in the lead-up to the post uh, lifting of the lockdown itself or post the lockdown and it says that they're going to uh, do policing around public events gatherings in communities etc uh, and i was thinking i thought that when, once you leave the road you 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 you're leaving the barricade etc you have to go back to the barracks or your bases and leave the public to roam around as freely as they can uh, but that's not what i'm getting with the information that they posted uh, why is that? Um, let's look first at the, at the lockdown. The lockdown was based on the principle that stay at home and go out only if you needed food or medication. Mm. And then we made exemption from the lockdown. So, largely what the president announced yesterday was that that stay at home order has been lifted. But the lockdown came or was even preceded by other restrictions. One border closure, for instance, restrictions on public gatherings and so on, whether of a religious nature or cultural nature. So, now that the president says that, good or bad, uh, you are allowed go out, you are not bound to stay at home. The police necessarily, plus the security uh, agencies, all of them, military and so on, now need to refocus. They need to redirect their efforts towards the remaining aspects of the restrictions. So as the IGP is rightly saying, or the police is rightly saying, there is no need for roadblocks and for checkpoints because everybody is allowed to move freely, taking into consideration other hygienic and social distancing measures. Now, the manpower, the spare capacity that the police and the armed forces and other security agencies generate will then need to be realigned towards the other measures to ensure that Sunday or Friday we don't have religious gatherings, that there are no weddings, Mm -hmm. beyond the number that is uh, stipulated, that burials may take place but subject to certain uh, limits, that funerals don't take place. So I think that is what the estimate from the police at least is suggesting. As regards the armed forces, remember they were playing a supporting role. So I believe that they might still continue in that supporting role. They might be held in reserve and if need be, can rapidly react to certain uh, situations. The armed forces may also be able to support the border security agencies because the borders still remain uh, closed. On the humanitarian side, the armed forces, plus the police, you know, continue to play other roles of a humanitarian nature. For instance, the mock that the armed forces are set up at Elwak or the normal modes that are being uh, used. Now, my reading into all of this is that from the word get-go, we expected too much of the security agencies, and yet we were not prepared to fully, you know, cooperate with them. So the enforcement of the restrictions or the policing of the remaining restrictions must be done in conjunction with local authorities. That is the only way that we can now be able into 
markets to ensure that there is social distancing. I don't think we're going to have sufficient police, men and women, and for that matter, soldiers going to market and other high-density population areas to go and ensure that there is social distancing. And of course, the role of the media is educating, you know, that it is in the interest of, of, of every one of us, you know, to comply with the guidelines that, that are still uh, in force. The, there's a, a point in, or a statement in the president's entire speech. We point to the fact that uh, depending on the community, the population mm -hmm. density and um, mm -hmm. uh, where they think it's a hot spot, then they will appropriately uh, do the monitoring uh, just to make sure that they comply with the restrictions and the orders. Mm -hmm. Now, you have mentioned coordinating or uh, having this linkage with the local authority. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say, let's take uh, a town that I know very well, Ashaiman, or I know mm -hmm. Nima to Mamobi, and um, all those relevant areas which are part of the hotspot, so to speak. How does the police um, already, with what they are doing, try to uh, do the monitoring in such a way that it is humanitarian enough, but also mm. very strict. Mm. So th that's precisely what I'm trying to suggest. That rather than us expecting the police to deploy into a shaman and be moving or let's say patrolling within the shaman, whether it's a municipality or locality, let's forget about that. They will be very effective if on arrival they set up business with the Ashaman local authority at the municipal level, assuming that it's a municipality, or at the unit level, you know. First of all, to work with these entities, together with the, the, the leaders of the different occupations or livelihoods. So if it's a market, market have associations. So you work with the leaders of those associations, the market as a whole, tomato sellers, plantain sellers, yam sellers, cassava sellers, animal sellers, and so on. That way, we'll begin to see more effectiveness in the work that the security forces will be doing. If we leave aside these local authorities, as we had done previously, we might see the police, we might see the military, but we're not going to be as effective as possible. And I did mention that that public education component, the sensitization, the outreach, must still continue. You know, that once I've said it before, that when I was placed in quarantine or under quarantine, once I understood the reasons why the quarantine was imposed, the conditions of the quarantine, the duration and so on, as a human being, I was prepared, you know, to accept that. So education, understanding, knowledge help to shape attitudes. Of course, I haven't talked about the humanitarian support. But people necessarily, if the statistics are right, that 80% of all the people in this country are in the uh, informal sector. They necessarily need to be up and about to make a living. So if the humanitarian support that is coming is not sufficient, of course, they're going to be about, up and about. Another role that they can play is to ensure that whatever is being sold on the market, you know, there is that freedom for everybody to buy whatever they need, as long as that social distancing, to the extent possible. Because it is extremely difficult in the locality that you've mentioned, Ashama, or Choco for that matter, and certain other localities where social distancing is an ID, it's not a reality. Because right from the bedrooms onto the streets, onto where they do, they go about their livelihoods, they cannot afford to social distance. That's the nature of the community in which, you know, uh, they live. And therefore, to go in there and expect that people are going to, you know, uh, socially or physically distance themselves, probably will be asking too much. Input is immense uh, as far as this conversation is concerned. And we're looking at the security implications of all this. And uh, 
Uh, the coronavirus pandemic itself has had a lot of uh, implications, and we'll look at the economic aspect because already we do know um, that following that security interaction, uh, Colonel Festus Abwaje uh, retired. A security analyst has helped us to look at how, beyond the voluntary things, we can get all those things um, going. Thank you very much. Uh, but we do have uh, streaming into the studio Professor Alfred Yorson, a member of the COVID-19 team, but also he's a public health specialist uh, in his own right, and so he's also an academician, so he helps uh, in many respects uh, uh, for all that to be put in, into perspective. Uh, we also do have somebody who is concerned about his health as well, and so you'll find that uh, over the last uh, three weeks, We've been having him uh, jogging or exercising with his family, but also giving us great input on the subject of the, of the economy. They, they are intertwined in a way, the health implications, but also having uh, an implication on public health and the economy. Because uh, when you have a productive population, it also means that they can contribute significantly to the growth of the economy. And uh, Dr. Lord Mensa is a senior lecturer with the finance department of the university of Ghana Business School. He's also joining us and uh, we'll have um, an economic health discussion, if that phrase is acceptable within the context of our discussions. But uh, look, first let me go to Dr. Alfred Yorson. Now the lifting of the lockdown uh, rules or the ban by the president, what are the public health implications in the first place? Knowing that people would have to now do actions by this time voluntarily all right thank you roland good morning to your viewers yes i must say the decision in all sincerity is a very tough one for that's what they then to do from the purely public health point of view, one will want to say that the project could have been continued a little bit. But looking at the situation on the ground and the difficulty encountered and also on the TVs and the difficult maintaining distance. So even after the lockdown, these were real challenges. And the people who are most affected are the ones who also have the most difficulty in maintaining So it's really a balance. So a lot more consideration apart from health medicine and public health went into the decision what i believe mm. but uh, by the time that the lockdown was instituted we had um, cases still under 60 okay now we've come to um a point where at the time the reason for the lockdown was to contain spread, halt the transmission of the virus as being the reason why we needed the lockdown. And now we say that we have enough reason because we are tracing the, the spread better or the contacts better. And then we're improving on testing, isolation, and all that. Um, that, that, that. That's a public health reason given by the president. Yeah. The essence of lockdown was to give the health system a breathing space to prevent it from being overwhelmed. So it gives you time to act as we call it, do the enhancing. Whereas the routine surveillance, you get people to stay at home in one place, map up the area, and do all the treatment, and also the testing. And the 
in fact, conducted the quite a large number of tests within the you know, of the lockdown. The challenge still remains because of the delay in results and the timeliness of it makes it difficult to really determine the the risk out there incidents of the content and how it is behaving really if we are ideally able to do then we will clear pinpoint the behavior of the within communities. We have quite good idea where the and it's becoming clearer that it's clustered within households. And therefore, if we are able to encourage other public like mandate where which the president encouraged, we think we mandatory so that we go on that line and try to so if it's clustering within half then not transfer it into the general community level it would be a useful measure also, there are other forms that are emerging apart from the Greater Accra and uh, Kaswa in Eastern Region and probably not region. We really need actively to look at these communities, trace, test, and as we say, you you get the positives, isolate them. And those who need treatment. Otherwise. So does it mean that the, for, for the ones that we have, we, we, we will be in a position to isolate them? We're told that we have about 18,000 more uh, uh, to, 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 to do some kind of refencing or fencing around. So we know where they are. And uh, we are sure that within the period, um, if they are going to have any contact at all, they are still within reach. Is, is that the public health implication? Yes, as much as possible. And we encourage people to limit contact at whilst the general tries to create more isolation centers. Remember, many of these that is, they may not be clinically ill, but potentially they can still have So we need to isolate them. And that's where they need to get test results as quickly as possible. It's important. Okay. Because you test somebody quite a number of days before um, for them to know the status, they would have been contacted and engaged with others. But able to get the test results, then decisions can be made if you cannot sell it because of fuel and economic circumstances, housing and other factors. Then you need to be taking the lead. Yeah, and properly monitor. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Alfred Yonsi is a member of uh, the COVID-19 team, the government COVID-19 team. That usually uh, will have members uh, representing the team, having briefings at the Ministry for Information. But we also do know that he's a public health specialist, he's an academician, he's a researcher, and so he's a uh, an expert in his own rights in the field, but also uh, having great implications on the economy is the health of the people. And that's why we're having um, Dr. Lord Mensah on stream as well. But Dr. Lord Mensah, when you hear all these, 
Um, it means that for those who are watching the economy and those observing both internally and externally, they, it gives them confidence. Is, is, is that it? Oh, well, yes. Um, looking at uh, what is happening on the ground in Ghana, you see, you cannot uh, use all fit all model to run every country. Now, looking at our economic structure, which is more informal, you know, i.e., people survive on daily basis, you know, how they move from one point to the other. It tells you that, you know, if you don't take care and you use a model in America for Ghana, you will end up having, you know, the lockdown or the measures to curb the virus, rather having more impact on the people than the virus itself. So um, I was reading the research, and it gives me it, it gave me the, the the signal that sometimes in a pandemic like this, the measures that are being put in place to ensure that they hold up the the, the virus rather comes to have more impact on the people than the virus itself. And I believe um, the president and his scientific team uh, have looked at all this, and they've realized that um, if we don't take care. This measure, which is the lockdown, is likely to have more impact on the economy than the, the virus itself as, as it stands now. And that is why possibly um, um, the, this, uh, the president softened his stance um, yesterday. So uh, for me, that is how I look at it. Mm. So you're saying that it's a chicken and egg situation, but also if you look at it, uh, there's always an opportunity cost for something and you have to take a decision. That's it. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's how I see it. All right. And we all do know just um, over the last two days before the close of the weekend or the beginning of the weekend, actually, um, Moody's came in with their ratings and uh, it's now negative. And that, that, that of course, uh, is down from positive, uh, same rate, B3, that we had at the beginning uh, of, the f of the first quarter. But uh, it, it, it is in perspective. For you, um, in what perspective do we see this, this type of rating uh, and where we are currently? Oh, yeah. Um, it, is, it is very, very important to have this um, rating um, because um, um, the situation on the grounds um, in the first quarter of the year, at the beginning of the first quarter, is completely different from the situation we find ourselves now and then possibly the outlook going forward. You, you know Ghana's uh, debt level has been a problem all this while. And uh, um, looking at what has happened now, it's definitely going to affect our revenue generation. And it, if it affects our revenue generation, then what, what is going to happen is, uh, in economics, we call something debt service, the debt service capacity, which is your ability to service your debt depending on the revenue that you generate, and then your debt availability. So um, if you look at it, the, what is happening now, there's a tendency that you know, our debt service will become a problem going forward. You know, what we rely on to generate revenue in Ghana? Uh, possibly we might rely on exports, you know, which um, if you look at uh, petroleum uh, prices on the global market, it has dropped dramatically to a level where um, I think in the past um, um, 30 years, we've never experienced such drop before. And then if you, if you look at um, in-house, the taxes that we're supposed to have, and all those that will generate revenue for the country, um, the prospect is very, very, you know, um, uh, bad. So effectively, any upgrading uh, agency that rely on this input will definitely downgrade a country like Ghana. And it's not Ghana alone. A lot of countries will have their credit ratings being downgraded. Mm. Just uh, some few weeks ago, just about a week, two, three ago, we had... Uh some of the bondholders, including ours on the continent, selling off. I mean, literally in that plain language. And it's also because they saw the outlook and they said, look, we wanted to cash in as quickly as possible, get out before there was a prediction. Show up, you know, an uncertainty, which they, they see to be something that they cannot easily predict. Obviously, you know, will we'll, we'll allow the investor to sell off his investment in, in such an environment. So, um, and investors are rational. I mean, obviously, they study the patterns and they look out for the future. So, if they see the future to be bleak, I mean, um, you will not hold up your money in an environment where you think um, the yield.
can is a bit shaky for you, definitely you're going to sell off your investment. So um, as, as a rational investor, that is what every investor um, do um, going forward. Mm. The finance minister in his, uh, in that uh, missive that he wrote, uh, that was published in the Wall Street Journal and also replicated uh, my, uh, the portals we have in Ghana, myjohnline.com, etc., about how an African finance minister in the sub-Saharan sub-region uh, is feeling and, and what is going through his mind, uh, copiously brought out the dilemma. Um, we still have um, massive trade deficits um, being experienced uh, even pre-COVID. Pre and, and now that we're going to have this deepen further post-COVID, and then even the lack of capacity in country uh, for us especially to be able to uh, shore up and build our reserves as quickly as possible. It also means that uh, the picture is not looking good. How, how bad is it going, it going to be uh, before it gets better? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely we should expect uh, um, rescue and all those. You see, this is a, a situation that uh, is not Ghana alone facing um, this uh, pandemic. We should expect that, obviously, um, as a country, we're going to receive some shocks. And Ghanaian economy, before even um, this uh, COVID, um, we're struggling, I mean, looking at our liquidity issues and to the extent that some banks were not even lending, you know. I knew some banks, I don't want to mention them, um, if you go on their balance sheet, lending was quite problematic, even though they were taking deposit. What they were doing mostly was doing overnight lending and possibly a extent of what, investing in treasury bills and all those. So it was an economy that was reeling. And in the end, um, you could see all the measures before the COVID that the, the, the government was putting in place to ensure that confidence in the economy is built up and investment can go from medium to what, long term. But as it stands now, the COVID has come to deepen it, like you said. And so uh, it, is, it's, it is a terrible situation. And I believe that because it's not peculiar to Ghana alone, uh, the shocks might not necessarily be felt as if, if, if it were to be, you know, it was a standalone or specific to Ghana's uh, problem. So um, it, it is quite um, a, a dicey situation. Um, we might find it difficult, you know, coming up. But once it's a global thing, uh, I believe um, there should be a rescue along the line. And I also remember the, the economic structure relies on um, other, you know, economies because it's an import oriented economy. And once those economies pick up, um, obviously, uh, we should see something good happening in, in our environment. Unlike the developed economies, um, the, the consumer spending and the patterns in our country doesn't impact the local, okay? And the more developed ones will take solace in the fact that when they give subsidies, ultimately they know that there, there is some end in sight in which it feeds back into the economy ultimately when everybody gets their job they then they have to keep paying their taxes and everything gets into stream it's not the same in our in our in our country and we're giving a lot of freebies and, and it's coming to or it's going to come back hard to bite us but it also has implications as to how they look at us uh, so there are fears that we're giving these subsidies and and, and they don't think we can recover in time is that what we're saying? Yeah, um, uh, Roland, let me correct this. Every economy, whatever the government spends, is more or less an investment in that direction. Because um, some part of the economy with very, economies with very good structures, right, if you go to the advanced world, the speed at which they will recoup the investment, I mean, i.e. the freebies that they are giving to their citizens, is, is quite um, faster compared to, you know, our environment because of the structures. You know, our economy, like I said, is more or less more informal. And in the end, it will take time before every single free bees that the government gives out, you know, for, bounce back to the government in a form of what, you know, taxes here and there. So it depends on the economic structure. It's not that uh, the free bees will just go down the drain 
uh, as um, you are you are painting the picture. But then the, it will definitely bounce back. But then it has to do with the speed, you know, the, 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 the timing that it would take for it to uh, bounce back. You know, in their environment, it's so fast to the extent that every agent within the economy is well engaged, okay? Um, i.e., every single household, you get somebody working or here and there. So if the person is working and you give him free beach today, the next time he goes to the job environment, you start taxing the person and it falls back. In our place, maybe somebody has to take it a free beach, try to work for another person mm. before maybe the person goes to work for another person somewhere before so all these transmissions you know for the government to realize what it's taxes so it's the economic structure that will determine the speed at which the investment that the government makes out of the freebies and how it returns to the government well great contribution there uh, as always and I, and I wish you well for the day and I know that uh, you're Thank continuing you some much, online interactions and uh, and I hope that it all comes out positive for you. Uh, Dr. Lord Mensah right. is a senior lecturer, the finance department, the University of Ghana Business School, uh, giving us the perspective uh, of all this, the ratings from Moody's, and how we need to have a, a better outlook and how the forecasting should be. I hope that we all have gotten educated. We're taking a break. When we come back, we'll bring you a gist of what's taking place in the entertainment world. Stay with us. Well, Ooh. relevant content for you this morning, but we have more content on regular programming on the channel. Yes, I'm back at 10 a.m. on News Desk. Listen, your life is in your hands. You know that, right? So make sure you have something, something protecting uh, yourself. If you don't have the surgical mask, grab something. It's, it's uh, better that you're protected by something or nothing at all. We hope that you take care of yourself. Stay safe whatever you're up to today. See you soon.